You're listening to your number one radio station. This is the Cannabis Community Project. Oh, oh, oh. yeah. Hey. Open up, Colorado. It's 420. Time to grind and burn. This is not your son, Stoner Show. Welcome to the Cannabis Community Project. Broadcasting from the Dank Studios, it's the Grind and Burn Show. High up in Denver, Colorado at 3835 Elm Street. Here's your host, Brainstorm. Looking for some cannabis products this year? 2017 is going to be the boom year for products. Find all the best ones on our website at the Cannabis Community Store. www.cannabiscommunitystore. We have all the products from Cushly to Herb Box, Can of Relief, and everything else cannabis related. As my great grandpappy taught me, <laughs> always check the knobs first. <laughs> it's a sign of a busy man, right? This is probably a Pokemon Go, right? It, it is about update. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I'm just going to assume you don't really know what this is all about or what I'm doing or anything else. I'm going to assume you're just thrown in at the last second. Let me just explain to you. I run the Cannabis Community Project is a network of podcasts all about cannabis. I do a show every week called The Grind and Burn, which is kind of focused on the entrepreneurs and business people functioning in the industry, learning about their backstory and how they operate in the industry and, and how the industry thrives based on the individuals involved in business and entrepreneurship, blah, blah, blah. So as I tagline it, not your son's stoner show, because uh, we don't really talk a lot about stoner type stuff. It's more about who you are in the sense of how you got into this industry. Uh, what do you do in the industry? Some maybe inner workings if you have a specific job or something you do. And then your foresights on the future. And more or less that lasts about 30 minutes. And then I'll put some uh, intro music and outro music to it. Put a little intro. And uh, if you ever get a chance, go to the website, CannabisCommunityProject.com. Listen to a few shows. You'll know exactly how this one will turn out once it's all edited. Um, it'll turn out to be like a 45 minute to an hour segmented long show with various segments and intros and voiceovers and music and everything else. This is one piece of it right here. This is not an expose. I'm not here to get you on anything. Just here to learn about you. The real goal of what I'm doing or what I would like to do is to uh, have other people that listen maybe get inspired to learn how to actually get involved in the industry in a legitimate way and get employed or how to just navigate something specifically and by maybe hearing your story of how you came from wherever you came from and got involved in in this industry somebody else will hear that story and go oh well maybe now it's time to quit my uh, data entry job and uh (laughs) you know take the lunge forward into the industry so that's the real goal of of what my show is trying to accomplish um but by all means have fun with it so if you need to tell me a crazy stoner story (laughs) feel free to do that too maybe you can give me an intro who you are what your title is and then if you have just like a uh, general comment to say or if not i can just go straight into a, a question we can have a nice natural organic conversation that will spontaneously end right about 37 minutes all right, <laughs> all right. Cool, cool cool but whenever you are ready and you can do as many times as you want because that's the beauty of recording of not being live so if you yeah, do something wrong, accidentally say the wrong name or something, forget who you are. Yeah. Just say it again. All right. Sounds good. Well, I be. Shuffling round me on my days, and I 
just can't change my Well, I'm Matthew McKenzie, and I've worked for Dank for some odd years now, going on about four or so. Um, and I first came into contact uh, through a friend, and uh, he had mentioned that there was a new spot available over at Dank. And at the time, I was just kind of working from job to job, um, any sort of thing from like being a delivery driver to working in the restaurant industry. And it was kind of jaded for the amount of work you had to put into those types of menial jobs. And but he's like, hey, if you get a badge, we can uh, make something happen. And so I went down and uh, picked up my badge and came in for an interview. And I met with one of the owners here. His name's Justin Jones. And we had a quick little talk. And he was like, yeah, man, uh, it'd be great to have you. We're a little uh, stocked right now. But we'll give you a call soon. And I remember being like, wow, man, I really hope I get a job there because I just got this license. Dang. And sure enough, it came together pretty quickly afterwards and uh, started to learn the ins and outs from the backside of the industry first. That was my intro was actually coming in and learning how to grow and, you know, doing all the basic tasks like cleaning, trimming, pruning, staking, trellising, any sort of thing along those lines. I was uh, getting my feet wet in and quickly noticed I was making a lot better money for the amount of work I was doing and actually doing work that was fun. Like I was having a good time and learning all sorts of stuff that would transcend into other things that would, you know, spark my interest, like just growing things in general, like my knowledge of how to prune things or like uh, be cognizant of a plant's needs and wants, you know, the marijuana plant works just like almost any other plant in, you know, how it strives to photosynthesize and grow and expand. So right. it's kind of uh, interesting to have that knowledge and then go back into your own garden at home and be like, man, this is the same thing almost. I can just 
I guess, <laughs> put both together in the same world. Okay. And then you didn't mm-hmm. say what your current title is. Oh, current title is uh, Bud Tender. Bud Tender. Okay. Mm-hmm. Is there like a level, like Bud Tender 1, Bud Tender 2, <laughs> Bud Tender 3? Pretty uh, much what it seems like in the industry <laughs> is that um, a Bud Tender will stick around for a while until they seem to be like self-managed and either they move up to the point of becoming a manager and go on salary or they uh, they stay up front working right. for those two. <laughs> it's like when I, years ago, I, I used to work for Wells Fargo Bank and I got hired on the cash vault and I was a utility clerk one. Mm-hmm. And then uh, <laughs> six months later, I got promoted to utility clerk two. <laughs> and my goal was to get to three, but I quit before I got there. How and, far do they go up? <laughs> well, uh, only tell three and then you have to get some other type of job, uh, I guess. <laughs> I see. <laughs> but uh, I'm always fascinated with titles of positions. So bud tender. So you're working behind the counter, mm-hmm. dealing with customers, shelling out buds. Are you a a full user and consumer of the plant itself and this is how your experience of the job has come or were you hired on and then trained how to handle and, and sling the plant to customers? <laughs> <laughs> um, definitely helped having experience in the past um, with you know the product itself but it is kind of funny um, a lot of people's journeys would probably be pretty similar to mine in that they didn't necessarily maybe have a ton of experience going into it and they learned pretty quickly. Yeah, But there are you know, for people starting up the business, you certainly want those people who have got a lot of experience in this industry. Right. So I mean, there's been a lot of new terminology and vocabulary over just the last five to eight years of okay. the industry, the public having to really learn how to uh, interact within this, this industry, how to learn words like indica and sativa and how to, uh, you know, approach plants and uh, pretend like you understand what you're talking about when you're ordering your, your products from the shelf and, you know, give that mm-hmm. meaningful nod as you're talking to your butt. <laughs> Tender, right? Oh, yeah. It, there's all these things that really, I, I think everybody, including the industry itself, has had to really educate on is that it's no longer just, you know, in the backseat of somebody's car getting your wound up baggy. You're now mm-hmm. having to figure out how to interact with the industry. So the term butt tender itself, that, that was tongue in cheek for a long time. And now it's just what it is. And yeah. It's mm-hmm. who you are. Where did you come from prior to three and a half years ago? Um, so I was um, in college when I started this job, and I was getting pretty close to finishing up. What degree? English degree with a okay. writing concentration and okay. a minor in studio art with an emphasis in photography. Wow. Yeah, so... Um, I see how that relates. Yeah, it totally relates in, <laughs> in the sense of that weed has always been a counterculture thing. It has been heavily associated with artistic creativity and seems to be an accomplice to that. Right. So that would be my introduction to it is the enjoyment of mixing art with marijuana and letting your creative juices flow. And that was like my start into weed was kind of uh, getting that creative spark from it and... You know, when I got an opportunity to work a job in it, I was certainly interested, no doubt. But when you were in school pursuing this degree, you weren't thinking about joining a dispensary. No. So what was the the image in your mind of how you were imagining your life kind of leaving school and being, what, what was it? I'll put it to you this way. At that time, I wanted to travel really, really bad, and I wanted, you know, good money to do it, and... um you know, with the type of jobs um, that were out there that were really normalized, you were busting your ass off to make less than what you could make growing weed because it's pretty high demand here in Colorado. So my real goal was to make a lot of money and then just travel the world for a bit, which I did. I went to Southeast Asia. Travel, Jack Kerouac on the road. (laughs) You were just out getting drunk. (laughs) Yeah, Yeah, rambling around. Right. Right. I can see it. I mean, I still would like to do that, uh, you know, if life ever allows me to, uh, in some form or another, uh, minus the alcohol. But, you know, in that same spirit of things. And I'm not much of a writer, but I could pretend like I... (laughs) I'm living that lifestyle. I'd meet Mm. people at bars and pretend like I was engaging in a life. Yeah, I think it's the fantasy of freedom, right? Yeah. It's the fantasy of freedom of being kind of on your own and engaging life and and out there and kind of pursuing life. Exactly. And this kind of job really fostered that sort of 
like mm-hmm. attitude. And what was really nice about it too was, uh, like I've said, I've been off and on with Dank because right. I've maintained a really good relationship with them. And they have like a real family type atmosphere here where you're able to do something like, hey, I'm going to Southeast Asia for six months and I hope we're all cool. And I came back and sure enough, since we left on good terms, they said, Matt, we would love to have you back. And they all took right. me right on board. Well, I mean, a good employer should recognize a good employee mm-hmm. and should recognize reasons of leaving i think traveling the world is legitimate it's not like you said i have to go to prison for a few years <laughs> will you accept my uh, application upon uh, release and, you know you want to travel the world and mm-hmm. and pursue something yeah. so do you still feel like you are in the, the pursuit of that working here like you have that freedom to still engage in your art and your writing and Certainly. you also said you're a musician mm-hmm. so you're you're still engaged in art where mm-hmm. does bud tending interact in that is it consume your life? No, definitely not. And I think that's why I enjoy doing it yeah. is because it really goes on along the lines of what you were saying. It's a job that allows me to have like freedom in life. Yeah. And I don't go home any day, like really pissed off ever. Right. And I can't say that. there's a lot <laughs> of really other jobs. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Of course you have your bad days at any job, but you know, in this type of industry, there are a lot of would that be client induced or management induced? Never, never really management. We're dialing thing in, you know, things in together. That's what's really yeah. cool about this industry. There's a lot of moments where people at the bottom of the totem pole and the top are actually like coming together and you know trying to solve issues. Like, right. and everyone's opinions are taken seriously. It's usually maybe as a lot of bud tenders, they get disenchanted with the mundane questions of you know explaining to adults. You know, put on your grown-up pants and, you know, don't be a champ and eat the whole chocolate bar. Like, you know, start off slow and some people want, you know, answers that you can't really give answers to sometimes. Well, I mean, you actually bring up a good point and it's a point that probably most people are wondering. They have questions about and and I don't know how many bud tenders get the chance to really give the inside scoop of... You know, the, uh, what are the crazy stories out there, the clients and so, Mm -hmm. but give us some insight, uh, walk us through a typical day of what it means to be employed as a bud tender. Tell us from the time you come in, do you clock in, do you pencil in, do you just tap your cap and say, Hey, I'm here. (laughs) (laughs) Walk us through a day. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, we got a, we got a digital time clock. So yeah, you go right up into that and press it like an iPad and keep track of your hours that way. Um, but when we show up, it's typically around 7.45. We open up a little bit earlier than a lot of shops around town. We're ready to go by 8. Um, what does the law allow for opening? I believe it's 8 o'clock the earliest. In, in Denver. Now I can't speak for... For med, rec, both. Uh, no, for um, the medical side, it opens up at 10 o'clock. Okay, so Denver allows 8 for rec and 10 for medical. Mm-hmm. Okay, so you're here just a few minutes prior to that, so there's no real setup or anything you have to engage in prior to opening doors? A little bit. Um, it's pretty fast. We actually yeah. used to have a half hour back in the day, and then we realized we were kind of twiddling our thumbs for about 15 minutes mm-hmm. after setting up and realized we could just get it together in that short yeah. amount of time. But it's really a matter of just like setting up the displays, taking all the product from all the safe spots into viewing spots. And I can tell you as a non-morning person, 15 minutes is a big deal when you're uh, hitting that snooze bar. Hell yeah, it is. We were all very happy (laughs) about that If you're twiddling your thumbs for 15 minutes at 7.30 in the morning, uh, you know, you you compare that against your hourly wage and all of a sudden your your sleep becomes more valuable. At least to me. (laughs) Exactly. I'll take the snooze. (laughs) So you come in, you you open shelves, you make sure a place hasn't been robbed, you make sure product's still there, Mm -hmm. everything things turned on. People immediately start coming in in the morning. Is it like a liquor store where you have a line of the late night winos waiting outside? <laughs> a little bit. Um, we almost always have someone waiting. Wow. Typically, yeah. Um, it's almost more rare if someone's not here uh, right when we open the doors. But yeah, it's it's really funny because oftentimes you're sitting there, you're like, man, these are some motivated stoners. Like, Jesus, <laughs> just waiting 15 <laughs> minutes like before we're even ready. And then Sometimes you'll realize you're like, oh, this person works like the night shift right. and you'll talk to them and they'll say, work. what's the heaviest cynic you got? I'm trying to get knocked out right now. And you're like, dude, it's eight o'clock. Like what? And then you're like, man, oh, you work. Like, yeah. Gotcha. 
And yeah. So there's a good amount of uh, those individuals that come bright and early. It makes perfect sense. Like they're looking for that nightcap right when the sun's coming up. Nice. Yeah. Is the day pretty much just a nonstop stream of behind the counter, customers in or out, or are you also engaging in other non-bud tending type activities? Yeah, definitely have little like side tasks. We do tons of like like the labeling. Like right. that's like a huge little side job of a bud tender is making sure you get your barcodes and um, you know information on there correctly. Other than that, as far as like the actual volume, it's very rush based. It seems. Right. Um, and you're dealing sometimes with big groups. Bachelor parties are huge bachelorette parties and general tourism for things like, you know, the ski industry, which is huge, right. obviously, here in Colorado. Yeah. But, yeah, you get your moments where it's a little bit slow, but it seems to be more steady and rush-based. And it's actually a lot of people wonder, like, when are you the most busy? And it's funny. It's just like any other industry. You got your morning rush. You got your lunch rush. And then the 5 o'clock when everyone gets (laughs) off and they need their weed. (laughs) Ironically, it's the same when I worked at McDonald's. Yeah, right? (laughs) Is is the question of what are some of the stupidest things you've heard already burnt out of what – people already know about has that already no been talked i would about? love to talk about this give us just uh, some of the you know the top ones of what are stupid customers yeah. and we assume they're all out of staters right roughly okay. but even every once in a while you'll have an in stater you're like did you really say that in here you know better i i always usually i'm in here on friday afternoons and it's funny just as i'm waiting for the door to be open watching customers come out with their cheese eating grins and you know they're like oh, in gosh. a haze of a world kind of stumbling around Mm-hmm. And you can tell the outer staters are just even more kind of just lost in this almost fictitious world. They're coming mm-hmm. out of the dispensary and I had a guy just shake my hand randomly because <laughs> he was just so happy. He was just bubbling and it's funny. And it's it's glad that the industry can bring so much joy just from its presence, yeah. uh, let alone the consumption of. Uh, but what were you going to say about uh, what should we call it? Like our top 10 stupidest? Uh, yeah. Uh, the, the do nots <laughs> and the do oh, up with some uh, with some good catchphrase like a good yeah. David Letterman type, you know, <laughs> <Right>. top ten lay. <laughs> yeah, you know, um, it's like a really new experience for a lot of people, so you got a lot of questions, and that's to be expected. But uh, on the bud tenders end of the spectrum, we want you to kind of think on kind of our perspective because we totally want to get you great product and we want to have a good conversation with you and inform you. But right off the bat, we don't want to talk about illegal things. Let's right. you know, like, and if you do want to talk about them, really think about that question and um, ask it if it's appropriate. I mean, you know, one of the biggest ones is how do I get this back home? And that is just not a good question. Just don't ask your bud tender that question because actually technically he should probably kick you out of the shop at that point. Right. Because he, he already knows he, you're engaging in illegal activity. Exactly. He can't sell to you now. So don't talk about, you know, leave <laughs> taking it out of state because it's flat out illegal. Even if it's from a legal state to another, there's a bunch of airspace in between here and there. And so it's still illegal. Um, right. maybe, w- maybe if I can just insert, maybe just yeah. as a joke, right? If we put a bowl of condoms on the counter <laughs> and put a little sign that says, you know, if you before you ask your bud tender, how do you get this back home? Just help yourself to a free condom and figure it out yourself, <laughs> right? You know, and then let, you know. <laughs> And then we don't need to say more, so please continue. <laughs> um, yeah, damn. Uh, another another one. Let's see. There's there's a good list of them. What's the most common type questions there? Maybe not necessarily the most ridiculous, but obviously people want to know sativa indica stuff, right? So they're yeah. probably constantly asking you about pain and sleep and mm-hmm. you know what's good for this what's good for that so i would i would assume the number one question you're getting is based around just specifically what do you recommend right mm-hmm. and yep. then from that how do you handle those situations do you have a centralized training that you've all been trained to proceed a list of questions or how to handle uh, customers as they're asking questions do you just individually have your own styles of how you interact with customers Totally. Um, yeah, everyone's got their own approach. And when it comes to those like uh, difficult questions, you only get so many strikes too. And I just saw the two other big ones I want to mention while I've got the airspace in front of me to help all the other bud tenders. You know, I mean, don't talk about minors either or people that aren't like with you, you know, that you're like, hey, I want to get this to my buddy. You know, you don't need to bring him in the conversation necessarily, you know, because um, we don't know. There's a lot of situations where we have to assume nothing 
everything about you. Right. Um, and just play by the law and reiterate the law. And we have to be totally transparent. So even if you want to ask about tenure, you know, what, what do I really do to, you know, break the law? They're still not going to give you the answer because we don't know if you're an undercover right. or not. And but, you are being filmed. Yep. <laughs> and there are undercovers who go and ask all these questions right. to us and try to get the right answer out of us, which is the wrong one. Right. I mean, it would be different, like, if you were talking to a bud tender, I don't know, like, on a podcast outside mm-hmm. of his job, and you asked him, like, hey, what would I do if I was it? But if you're actually standing behind the counter, you almost have to treat them like they're kind of an undercover cop, in mm-hmm. a sense. Yeah. They're working for the state. They're licensed by the state. They're obligated to disclose certain information if given that information. In a sense, you're kind of a de facto undercover cop working within a dispensary. Mm-hmm. Uh, how do you feel about that? <laughs> <laughs> Tell me how you really feel. Um, and then you said you had two more. So what was the other one, the, the other big one? One of the other big ones, too, is like, just show us your license. A lot of places will ask for it twice, and we're oh. just trying to ensure that we don't make mistakes. Oh, people just getting oh, snappy pe- about, people get I just showed it to the guy outside. Yeah, kind yeah. Of how many times in your see this is worse than the airport <laughs> this is worse than tsa you know i want to ask you a question do you think i like absolutely love checking ids all day if i didn't have to that'd be great but like you get paid a commission yeah. every time you check an id yeah. or something to... and along lines with that <laughs> what a lot of people think is ridiculous is like come on man sonny i've been smoking weed longer than you've been alive i can't tell you how many times i've heard that one right but a part of me also wants to be like, well, I do tell them sometimes that even if it's expired, I can get in a lot of trouble. Right. And that's one of the main things we're looking for when you got no hair on your head. I already know right. you're old enough. It's the the Willie Nelson scene from um, – uh, what was the movie with Jim Brewer and Dave Chappelle? Uh, half baked, yeah, right? Yeah. When, when uh, he's you know he's sitting with Willie Nelson on the porch. I remember when the dime bag used to cost you know yeah. that, that whole thing. Yeah, I'm sure you get a lot of old timers who constantly want to condescend. The, you know, <laughs> I've been just, just tell them not this weed. Yeah, yeah. I've been smoking oh, this yeah. weed since before I was born. I had some Malcolm Poke gold. <laughs> yeah, man. Oh, we talk about Thai stick a lot. Oh yeah, right. <laughs> all this stuff from Cheech and Chong albums. Um. <laughs> In the in the the realm of compliance, you had to get badge. So to be a bud tender, you, do you have to have a key or a support badge? You have to just have a support badge. Just a support badge mm-hmm. because you're a non-managerial or key functioning mm-hmm. type figure. But as far as that, do you have to have any additional training or compliance from an industry standpoint to be a bud tender? No, but you will be a little bit more desirable if you um, have taken some sort of background classes, like one I did. Was I comply? Explain Um, what that is. It was pretty much just a compliancy program that um, their whole goal is just to inform every bud tender that they can and, you know, manager just the ins and outs of how to do the job without making mistakes and keeping it all legitimate. So, a general compliance class for the industry. How did you acquire that? uh, Uh, Dank actually paid for it. They, um, yeah, they just wanted us to be informed just so they could say their staff has gone through the rigmarole of like. Smart employer. Yeah. Yeah. Certainly. And it was a big help to all of us. Like when you take just one of those classes, you can walk away and be like, all right, I heard the rundown. There's not the gray area of like, what about this? And right. You still run into those, but nonetheless, you got plenty of people to talk about it here. You right. Know. Well, that's the, that's the upside of regulation. You know, as much as those shall complain about regulation and intrusion and cost and making people do stuff. The upside is people actually learn stuff by being, you know, forced to learn about compliance. You actually learn something and then it makes your job better and it makes the industry better all around. So it's a win-win on that one. Does the facility to be a butt tender require any specific skills from you? So from an industry, no, but it helps to have like an I comply or some other type of course. And I assume these are like weekend courses or week long, hour long. Mine was like a two session oh, okay. uh, thing. It was pretty quick and it, we were on the clock. Yeah. It was just another day of work and we did it in shifts where like half the staff was on working and then we swapped them out. Okay. Yeah. So in and out. So does Dank require you to have any special knowledge or skills? Did you have to prove to them that to be a bud tender, you knew the plant, like you had a symbiosis going on with the plant and Mm -hmm. you knew you could rattle off strains, uh, you know, from memory (laughs) and, you know, you you knew how much THC percentage this strain. I mean, did you have to do any personal proof of competence to be employed? Mm -hmm. Well, for me, it's a little different because when I made the transfer over to a bud tender, I had already been 
working in a grow, which was our grow at the time. Because I've worked for a couple of dispensaries, and that made the transition into being a bartender very easy because I've grown wheat, so right. I understand it to some degree. Um, when you're trying to dive straight into the tender position, it certainly helps to have your background knowledge on, like, kind of even what the land race strains are, where right. all this weed comes from, like you know, who's done the crossing, the legality too. Like it's been this ever evolving thing. So doing your own personal research is just hugely helpful. Um, Cause a lot of people like to come in with a resume that says, Hey, but I smoke a lot of weed, hire me. And it's, right. uh, it's not what we're looking for. Really. Right. Unless there's a job for a weed consumer. Do you need, do you need to hire somebody that needs to just smoke weed? Cause I want to apply. Those are your job. bud tenders. Oh, damn. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so so it helps to know this, but does that information actually translate to the customer? Are customers coming in and inquiring this type of knowledge from their bud tender about the grows and the, the, the details of how things are grown and the, all that? What are the customers actually looking for? So I would say the majority of them are are basically at the basics of like, hey, like, is it a sativa or an indica? And they're kind of wondering those intro questions. But then you have like um, the whole echelon of people who, you know, they want to know what nutrients you're using right. or like what, you know, solvents were used to extract this and a lot of intricate questions right. upon infusions. And and um, do you find they're asking you this to challenge you or because they're genuinely trying to just smoke a better product and they want to know if you're up on your game of growing? I don't know. Maybe I'm a little biased, but some of those those guys, I would say the, ma- the majority of the ones who come through really hammering questions at you just want to show you that they you smoke more weed than you. Yeah. And they know more weed. Yeah. More weed questions and answers than you might be able to. Because they um, still just buy the cheapest stuff anyway. Yeah. At the end of the day. <laughs> right. That's <laughs> so. what ends up happening. Like, really? <laughs> yeah. No, but you got a lot of great people who have awesome questions. They They really want to know for their own personal benefit. And there's people who have like certain conditions where they have to be cognizant of what they consume. Like, and that really plays out in the edibles, especially. I totally support and understand why people have a lot of questions for the edibles themselves when it comes down to not being able to like, you know, consume nuts for instance or something like that. Right. And dairy and other types of issues, uh, health issues. Do you, do you find yourself engaging with people individually based on how you sense they are? Yeah. You, you don't have just a, a set uh, interaction. Depending on mm-hmm. who they are, you will engage with people individually different. Mm-hmm. Um, some people, if they're there just to buy, you engage with them like a retailer. You know, mm-hmm. what do you want? Here's the price. Thank you. Goodbye. Other people, if they're looking for some actual information and advice on pain, you'll take time with them mm-hmm. or medical stuff. Is that also a personal thing or is this something from a company training standpoint um you get a pretty good sense of it pretty quick i would say um for starters when i see someone walking around with googly eyes like right when they come in it's pretty obvious they're not from here um if you're if you're wide-eyed and you can't like focus on a single thing <laughs> that surefire sign i'm like oh you're a tourist yeah. that's easy because you know local Coloradans, they're, they're just walking straight up to the counter right. and they're asking two words like indicar sativa that one right and like that's how they, want they the order. retail experience yeah yeah, yeah they want to get in and out yeah. whereas uh, some people want to come in here and just pull up a chair and just talk about weed and yeah. then at some point you're like hey i gotta line out the door bud right we gotta get this going you need a lounge <laughs> I <know. dink> lounge <laughs> <laughs> wish we have one <laughs> yeah for the new well kind of twisting, yeah right, yeah, right. <laughs> you know but again uh, to the question of is this a training thing or is this just you as an individual engaging with customers like this um definitely not so much a training thing because when you get the sense for somebody um you can cut a lot of the bs and go straight to you know like the meat of maybe what they're trying to get to yeah you know i I do give like an overall spiel that i have ready for everybody and i'd give that to anybody and that's just like the lay of the land because most people um are just trying to focus on one thing it's kind of like a lot to take in for people and i totally understand especially if it's like your first time right but it's kind of like basic things my spiel will like usually start with like hey there's our menu and people like whoa you have a menu (laughs) it's like yeah we do yeah (laughs) and you know you can open the jars give them a whiff no touchy you know those sort of things and just kind of like let them take it in yeah Yeah, almost need like what's that restaurant the italian restaurant pip pip 
Bippo, the Ippo or something, where you come in, they ask you, have you ever been here before? And if you've never been there, the first thing they do is they take you on the grand tour. They take you through the kitchen. Then they take you through the back. And, they, you know, they give you a grand tour if it's your first time because the restaurant itself is kind of so overwhelming that they don't want to uh, hold you up with the reoccurs that come in. So they almost have two lines. Have you been here before or is this your first time? If you've been here before, then it's just straight to here's your table. Let's get you seated. If this is your first time, then they take you on a whole tour and it's a whole different thing. And, you know, maybe, maybe there's a setup that needs to be done there for first timers. Oh, yeah. I know the first timers <laughs> want a tour of the grow oftentimes. Yeah. We would be giving tours all day. If that right. Was just make the wall translucent. <laughs> hey, some people got a nice little glass. You can just peer right into their grow. So going to the opposite extreme of this, then what are, have there ever been an angry customer? Why? Why would somebody get angry? You know, for some of those things I brought up earlier, like hell, old timers showing their ID. I've had plenty get real mad just yeah. me asking for their ID. Also, even when you tell people, you know, and they'll get a little flustered when you're telling them like, hey, you can't be talking about taking this out of state. And they'll be like, well, why not? You know, and they'll get all upset real quick. And it's like, hey, because that's illegal. Yeah. Um, but, you know, like any other place, you're going to get crazies through right. the door. That's just life in general. And you got people that got chips on their shoulder, you right. know? Oh yeah. Over the phone, I've had a, a couple people that are real crazy. You know, we got prank phone callers too. <laughs> so leading into that, what is the security issue? Because this is kind of a elephant in the room, right? Within the industry, there's been a few incidences and with all incidences, it makes people question, you know, am I safe? Mm -hmm. As a bud tender, do you, do you feel safe in your industry, in your environment? You know, when we hear about things, things happening, isolated events happening. How does that reflect on what you do? I definitely feel safe, um, especially because like most companies, like Dank has a policy where the human life's going to come first. Like, you know, we're taught like any other place, like give up the register. We value your life a lot more than, you know, some paperbacks. You know, I think you got to be pretty ballsy <laughs> to hold up a dispensary, even though that did happen. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, we do little things. We walk our, our ladies out to the car at night, you know, because chivalry is not dead. <laughs> Ladies. <laughs> but, <yeah. laughs> but, you know, it's it seems pretty safe. And I think a big part of that is because the weed itself, you know, is a very calming thing for a lot of people. It's, so after you walk the ladies out, who walks you guys to your car? <laughs> <laughs> we make that trudge on our own. <laughs> I guess there's only so much you can do with any business, you know, whether I, I used to work at a bank and it was always kind of a question I would have in the back of my mind. Mm -hmm. You know, same thing, you know, just... Oh, but hey, I just remembered, like, to answer your question a little bit more, so, like, I just thought of, like, one time someone got mad, like, little things that are beyond our control, like, there's little rules, like, when you have your uh, medical paperwork and you don't have the actual card uh, itself, yeah. you can only shop till... Five o'clock right. with this little green uh, card. Um, that's and, her first time card, not renewals, <laughs> so, which also pisses people off. Exactly, that if you're going that's to renewal one where they like, let it lapse. Yeah, it was, I've seen people. You know, as I was saying, as I come in every week, I've watched people continuously. It's surprising come up and try to get in without cards. And mm -hmm. after a while, you go, well, maybe I understand once or twice. But some of these people, it's like. They're just taking shots in the dark, just hoping yeah. they'll just stumble right in because yeah. they're, they're literally like, hey, I uh, left my card at home, but can I still come in? You don't you have me in your system or something? Oh, yeah. <laughs> and that, yeah, that's another one. When you have to turn someone down because of an ID, like, man, some people lose their shit because yeah. they've you know built an entire vacation right. off the whole weed thing. And then they get here and they find out that they can't go to a single one. You know, So do your research. That's what I also want to say to everybody listening listening out there, you know, like kind of look into it. Um, you know, what are the laws? Like you can ask your bud tender, but kind of having some of your back knowledge won't hurt. Yeah. You know? Well, I mean, at least having an ID. I mean, yeah. if you don't have a med card, that's one thing, but if you, you got to have at least an ID. Yeah, I, mean, I know. Who are these people? I know. I know. <laughs> so what is your vision for the future on, let's start with just the industry and then we'll end with your personal self. So what is your vision for the future of the industry? Where do you think it's going? What do you think will happen over the next year or two? I think it's going to be a lot more normalized. We had five states come forward recently, you know, just getting that legislation a little bit further on down the road, you know, to allow, you know, the the medical marijuana or recreational marijuana
marijuana to like come on through to the people because the people want it in those states, especially that are, you know, voting it in. I definitely see it becoming more commonplace and people becoming more accepting of it and really seeing the value in it in itself, whether it's, you know, on the individual basis or from an economic standpoint, because I have that conversation a lot. A lot of people from other states are somewhat jealous in the fact that Colorado is prospering right now. And yeah, we're happy. A lot of us are. It's a good place to live. And, you know, we're not babies out here. We're tired of being told that we're children. We can't have something that, you know, we should be able to have access to. And I think the consciousness is changing in the world big time. I really feel it. And I'm pretty excited for that because weed has been demonized way too long. Well, those who don't want it to succeed root for its failure. Mm -hmm. Uh, Do you think the new administration will have any impact good or bad on the industry? Oh, well, that that's an interesting question because uh, Trump is a wild card as a lot of people like to refer to him as. So you don't 100% know his intentions all the time. But um, then again, it's not even necessarily all his decision. That right. really breaks down statewide. And that's what people got to really keep in mind. And that's why I've been assuring people like we it's going to stick around for a bit. It, as I put it to people too, it would be like the prohibition. Like if you give people a right and then you take it away people lose it yeah so it survived the bush administration Mm -hmm. uh, when most of these medical laws became solidified in states like california and colorado a long time ago long before the boom of obama in this whole industry we're living in now there was a medical industry going on and it survived some administrations just the same. You ever listen to Freakonomics? You know what that is? The podcast or... You heard of it, but I haven't listened to it. Yeah. For anybody that knows what that is, there's an episode called How Much Does the President Really Matter? And I would encourage you to find that episode on Freakonomics and listen to it because it puts things in perspective that as much as we like to think the president has a finger in every part of our lives... The reality might be different. This industry, I also agree, is probably not going backwards, regardless of what the, an attorney general may do or may not do or anything else. I mean, the, the feds were raiding dispensaries all through the Obama administration. The feds were raiding uh, growers and doing everything on their behalf to try to slow the industry, even while Obama was in office. So it didn't seem to falter there. And, and I doubt uh, Trump, who I think is pretty agnostic on the issue, um, he could probably go either way, depending on you know, what's in it for him Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> kind of deal. So I, I think with that in mind, I don't think the industry really has much to fear. Let's end it. You personally, where do you go from here as a bud tender? Does the industry provide a real structure in the sense of like a corporate structure? If we thought like an insurance company or a bank, or you worked for ABC windows and siding or something, is there a structure that allows you to grow over the course of a lifelong career with a company or do you have to pretty much leave one thing to to advance uh, yourself i mean explain to us uh, how how a dispensary is structured in the sense of where promotions come in mm-hmm. is there job levels obviously there's managers but within that is there levels is there places to grow and go mm-hmm. what is your personal desire and what is the reality so yeah um like any other job you can kind of top out at certain positions um you know to some degree um like any other teller position where you're working a register there's kind of a max pay for that now where you can really excel you know like a bar we work for tips and that's a big thing and a lot of um tourists um may not even consider that i have never although i do tip i have never considered it as being a percentage of your pay Mm -hmm. i do it because tip if there's a tip jar and i I also work for tips and, you know, I understand it, but it's never crossed my mind that that may be a percentage of your, your living wage. And it's, it's actually a big part for bud tenders. So where you can exceed is by giving people like exceptional service, you know, and really actually taking the time to answer questions. Cause I have heard kind of a problem in the industry is like the curtness of answering questions. Cause we get a lot of BS <laughs> questions, but we also get a lot of good ones. And, you know, some people don't have, you know, patience. So I'd recommend to somebody who wants to be like, you know, like a good bud tender or to kind of advance themselves, hopefully into a managerial position. I, I have to jump in here because yeah. we can't move on without thoroughly addressing this issue of the interaction of bud tenders with, with customers. Um, before I became a exclusive dank customer, 
right? Uh, I used to frequent many, many dispensaries. And, and then I talked to many people, just in the nature of what I do and all this stuff. And so the fact that you bring that up, that there is a perception out there that bud tenders can sometimes not be the best uh, oh, yeah. customer service or interactive oh, yeah. type people. Let's also go a little bit deeper on that because I've been to many dispensaries and I find that like there's people, right? There's mm-hmm. people, but really the dispensary kind of prunes a culture of how their people are. Totally. And, and when you walk in a place, there's some places that are obviously trying to be the hip, cool, you know, dispensaries. Mm-hmm. And there's other places you walk in, they're trying to be very clean and corporate and very, you know, nice mm-hmm. and everything's modern and updated and everything has it's in its place. and Or it looks like a pharmacy. Or, right. Or it looks like a pharmacy. You walk in some places and it's kind of dirty and everybody looks kind of hippie-ish. And, you know, it's yeah. like every every dispensary has a culture where they either hire people that are kind of like them or the people kind of just become like them <laughs> yeah. as, as they get hired. It, and again, I'll ask this in the same sense. Is there a training that goes on and then is there an individual style amongst yourself that you personally try to give off? But is there a corporate anything – forget the word corporate. Is there a company-wide either training or just environment that comes down that kind of directs how you should be and act and how you see your counterparts interacting with customers that also affects you? And don't worry. Nobody listens to this show, so you can speak freely. I guarantee you. You just heard out in the hall. Jay doesn't even listen. So <laughs> speak freely. Nobody you will hear what the hell you're saying. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah you know, you got to cultivate your own style and approach. And man, I, I really like that ad dirge you went on there. I have <laughs> noticed the same exact thing. I've walked in those places where you got nothing but dudes and ponytails and you're like, hey man, could I get a join? They're like, yeah. And they already grab it. And you're like, which one did you grab? He's like hybrid. And you're like, hybrid what? Hybrid. Okay. How how much is it? Ten dollars. And you're like, oh, okay, all right. And then, uh, how, do you know what it tested at? No. And you're like, <laughs> how are you in business? Like, this is crazy. Like, right. But yeah, the, and that's yes. the cultivated. Like, we've got the product. You're in the mountains. Take it or leave I'm it. I'm the dealer. Yeah. <laughs> you're the customer. You want it or not? <laughs> yeah. Here's exactly. the baggie. <laughs> yeah. Uh-huh. <laughs> like what we do here to cultivate our sort of um, style. Like, for instance, a big part of that comes from even just our playlists, our music. Each one of us gets to pick like three artists that we want to pick. And, you know, people come in here and they go, damn, like that was some hillbilly bluegrass. And now it's like straight up hardcore gangster rap. That was a quick transition. And that would actually be really reflective of what we we got going on here. But um, yeah, we, we try to keep in mind all the things that go along with the weed culture. We've got a Bob Marley poster. I can put it to you that way. <laughs> but we just like to keep it, you know, like pretty mellow. I feel like at Dank, it's a little bit bit more of it's not like that pharmacy feel it's a little bit more i guess uh sleek you know we don't have that like i went into one recently that has that like western um barn feel everything wow was, yeah it was kind of <laughs> cool really finding their niche really. i know i was like man i haven't seen one like this but yeah yeah every place has their own sort of style though i like that well I, I would uh, next time i talk to jay on the microphone i'm going to ask him some of these questions if if they have an actual customer that they're going after or if it is just kind of a door open whoever comes in comes in i mean obviously if you're making a barn uh you know dispensary you have a customer in mind yeah. and there's a specific person you're trying to get through that door mm-hmm. uh, just as if you're you know everybody is uh tie-dye and and Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, oh, yeah. versus, Crocs, <laughs> right? Versus anything else, uh, you know, everybody has long beards and you know man buns, and yeah. you know wh- whatever the environment is that you're in, uh, that you know that will be probably the people you attract. Mm-hmm. So I, I'm always curious, you know, as you say, it's like how are you even in business? You know, I'm always mm-hmm. curious to what the thought is, not just from the top down from management. Sometimes there is no thought. You know, sometimes it is. Like like, well, the doors are open. Whoever comes in, comes in. You know, mm-hmm. we'll accept anybody, but we're not really going after anybody. Mm-hmm. Or there are people who, like, we would like this type of person to come in. Do you yeah. think about that? Have you been taught anything by your managers of who we would like to bring in? I'm really happy you brought that up because uh, I want to put this out into the ether. <laughs> At Dank, we reward nice people. Like if you're nice to us, you come in and you make our day better. We'll make your day better every single time. Like, and that's just what we go for. And you know what? Also, if you don't ask for a discount, you get a discount here. It's almost like flat 
plain and simple. Like if you're that kind of person, if you just come in here with your sorrowful story begging for a discount, I've heard it. You know, yeah. like a lot of other people around town have probably heard your same story. Right. And you know what? You'll probably get a discount from me if you just you just treat me nice, treat me good. Right. You know, I'll try to take care of you. But if you know your your burdens and your problems come on me, it's like well, why do I want to hook you up? You're just bitching to me. You know. Who complains more about price, out of towners or locals? Locals. Yeah. Right. Because yeah, an out of towner doesn't really know, and they're here already on the vendor. Right. Mm-hmm. They're already bought the travel expense they're already paying for the hotels and the ski trip oh, yeah. or whatever the they're they're already on vacation so an extra fifty dollar an eighth or more mm-hmm. i don't even know what the price are anymore <laughs> but uh, you know uh, you know whatever the high price is is already part of that vacation package whereas a, mm-hmm. a local person who's buying buying on a weekly basis is probably more in tune to their pricing and yeah and mm-hmm. what's going on and so forth but i don't know is there a split that you know of between local reoccurs versus out of towners coming in of what the percentage of business is uh yeah um here at dank we keep a good tracking system on that and we do more business with out of towners it's actually pretty close to 50 50 though but it leans a little bit more on um, the tourist end of the spectrum. Okay. And that actually comes by like uh, location. Right. Because there's some places that like they'll do mostly local business and very little tourist business. Like for starters, like I always like try to tell people too, and this isn't, you know, 100% true, but pretty true that like when you're shopping for weed in Denver, you have your pick of the litter. Like yeah. there's so many of these things. Um, so that drives the cost down. And when you get up into the mountains, that's when weed gets real expensive and you're yeah. kind of isolated. And they, that's one of those situations where we were talking earlier where they've got you. Yeah. You've got the product, you want it or not. Right. You're going on your mm-hmm. ski trip to Breckenridge or some other little ski town up mm-hmm. in the mountains. A couple hours from Denver, you're not going to have. Well, I don't know. I mean, last time I drove through the mountains, it does seem like more and more dispensaries seem to be they're, popping up. But they're popping up. Uh, point given, far mm-hmm. less than being mm-hmm. in the city metropolis of uh, oh, Denver yeah. here, mm-hmm. where literally almost on every corner. <laughs> yeah, for sure. And you know, like, and to go along with what you're, you know, talking about the pricing, um, you do have wildly different prices here in Denver. You know, like just a funny little tidbit, um, an interaction. I have this lady. She came in all flustered, like wide eyed, just walked straight up to me. She was like, "Well, I just bought a fifteen dollar eighth. and I was like. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like I, I thought she was going to get mad or something. Like, why aren't your prices that cheap? And I was like, yeah, so was it good? And she was like, it was awful. And I was like, well, it costs $15. Like, that's garbage yeah. weed. Like, yeah. And she, yeah, she was like, man, I'm never doing that again. And I'm like, well, there you go. Yeah. Like, a lot of people, you know, sometimes think they're getting ripped off and they're paying more for weed. But that's yeah. not true. You know, like, it's sometimes it pays right. to like pay a little bit more. You get better weed for sure. Right. It's <laughs> like going to the dollar store and complaining because the item you bought just isn't up to quality. You know, it's like, well, let's move from, from dollar store and upgrade to Walmart. Yeah. And right. then from Walmart, we'll, upgrade to target and then yeah. we'll, we'll keep stepping our way on up the ladder there yeah i had like a little moment that reminds me the other day at walmart um i was buying a leatherman and uh i had two out there's one there's one for four dollars and 95 cents and then there's a gerber for like 35 and i remember looking at the you know the shiny cheap one and i was like "Ooh, that costs nothing and the guy's like yeah let me pull it out and I take a look at it and like it's almost like it's falling apart, falling apart like in my hand and i had one of those moments like like where I was a consumer, I was like, man, this one isn't that good. And he was yeah. like, yeah. And I was like, should probably go with the, the nice one, right? <laughs> and I was like, duh. Like, I was like, yeah. I, I said that out loud, didn't I? I was like, yep. I was like, I, I tell everybody I bought a bicycle years ago from Walmart that I literally had to exchange five times before finally just asking for my money back. And then I went to Target and bought one that I still have today. Yeah. And uh, things literally fall apart in your hands. But it's mm-hmm. rock bottom prices, and yeah. that relates to almost any business, almost almost one hundred percent of the time, mm-hmm. uh, across the board. You know, you almost get what you pay for in mm-hmm. that sense. So, with that being said, let's quickly just kind of jump back to where do you want to take this industry personally? Do you want to be a manager? Do you want to run a dispensary? Do you want to run a grow? Do you want to get out of this business? Well, what is your personal exit strategy uh, of being a bud tender? I always like parlaying, you know, a job into another job. And I'm um, pretty well-rounded in this industry because I've worked a number of jobs. Um, 
And I've definitely toyed with the idea of a state going legal um, because that's where the money's at is when a state is just getting going. Because when you're tapped out in, um, you know, a city that's been pumping out a lot of weed for years and counting, that opportunity starts to dwindle for the buco bucks that happen very quickly. Because there's a difference when your state goes legal to where it's been legal for a couple of years and right. the novelty wears off a little bit. So you're talking about investing into a license in a new state and being part of a new operation of yeah. a new state. Mm-hmm. I would say that's one of the more attractive things to somebody who knows the industry from kind of like an inside perspective is seeing that opportunity and knowing that as soon as people open up the doors in a place where it's never been available, people are going to keep coming in for sure. It makes sense. I mean, the new opportunity, first comer, uh, you know, anytime you can enter a market first, there's always the opportunity of making more profit. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if Colorado is saturated a little per bit, se, but uh, it may just be restricted of licensing. You know, mm-hmm. I think if we change some of the licensing, we may have some different uh, booms of more opportunities, more places opening. Also, once the you know we get more hemp production going in, that kind of stuff. So you you want to be an investor or operator manager? What's what's kind of the uh, hey? I'm 35 and this is what I've become. Vision. <laughs> Well, well, I depends. take it you're not 35 already. No, right? okay. uh, uh, that was a good guess. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're having Jay on the show, right? <laughs> Coming up here pretty soon. Yeah, don't don't air this one for him. No. <laughs> no, like I said, nobody listens. What, what, what do you, what's no. what's the desire? The desire would be to, um, yeah, I, I could totally see myself. Um, managing a dispensary or helping one get off its feet with like, you know, the, the basics. Cause you need to know the, you know, all the well-rounded aspects. Cause that's what I really like about Dank kind of in closing is I feel like Dank has a very well-rounded um, aspect to it. We're not a dispensary that's gonna, you know, if, if we have a problem in the back, um, we're not going to let it come out the front door. And I, I tell you, I've worked for some dispensaries. If they've got problems in the back they're they're covering it up and putting it in a bottle and sending it out to you because, you know, it, it's costly to make mistakes in this industry if you don't have a batch come out right. But there's a lot of them that won't take the time and patience or take take the bullet, you know. Um, but that's one really nice thing about Dank is they stand by their name and their quality and they're not pulling people's chains and they're all about the high quality weed and, you know, like some of those classic strains and they got a good thing going here for sure. Ooh, that's the next interview. We're going to expose some dispensaries and out them yeah. on all their poor practices. <laughs> We're going to sneak up on them with a microphone, tap on their door. Oh, what, what we've always <laughs> talked about. I, God, of course I wish I... When I get the moment in the microphone to tell of all the crazy <laughs> people we've had walk through the door, they don't come to mind. But we've thought about a little show where you could get a hidden camera and ask bud tenders the worst questions and just keep pressing them <laughs> over and over. Like, hey, I got I got a, my little brother outside. He's 18. He he loves Indicas. What would you suggest for him? And it's like, oh, God, could you imagine like filming a bud tender? Let's do it. Reaction? Let's yeah, set right. it up with Jay. Hey. Jay, let's get permission. And <laughs> yeah. uh, we'll just keep it uh, just amongst ourselves. Yeah. We'll set up a camera and then we'll we'll get a whole line of, of clients lined up yeah. and we'll just do a whole day of just nonstop. Oh, just the worst <laughs> question. And then we'll edit it together yeah. and put up a nice YouTube video. Totally. Yeah. Just walk into a dispensary that has 50 <laughs> strains on display and say, this is all you've got? <laughs> That's one of my favorites. <laughs> just like, Let's do it. Yeah. Totally, totally do it. I, I could uh, I could do stuff like that all day long. We got hidden cameras? How, how small we got, man? <laughs> what we will do is you gave me an idea that I do want to do. Do do. <laughs> um, I want to come back and I want to get segmented recordings of uh, customer stories that I can uh, edit together as just sole individual little segments and stuff, little clips. Yeah. So I, I do want to come back and have you and some of the others maybe give little story, customer stories of stuff I can insert into the show. Oh, yeah. You know, a little one minute, two minute, a little bit. So That'd be awesome. keep that in mind. And then in the short future, I'll, I'll come calling on you to give an, a little story yeah. or two. And then I'll start collecting here. them. I'll be prepared this next time. <laughs> <laughs> well, very good, man. Let's give uh, some contact information for where we're located so people can come and visit you personally yeah. and tell them, tell them you heard them right here on the Grind and Burn. And uh, don't ask for a discount. Just tell them you heard them on the show. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then you'll get a discount, promise. Let them know where we're at. <laughs> 
All right, yeah, we're at 3835 Elm Street, Denver, Colorado, right off of I-70, not too far from Colorado Boulevard in that intersection right there. And can we find some websites or social media? Yeah, check it out on, I think it's dank-colorado.com. You can check out our menu, see our strains there. Oh, and a little side note there, like most dispensaries, we list everything that we grow. But if you're looking for something in particular, it never hurts to call us just to see if we have that strain available today because we just want to tell you what we got but they go quick sometimes and that's like most places too excellent man are are you still on the clock were you on the clock this whole time all right so in a sense i kind of paid you to be on the show yeah this was awesome so uh (laughs) you're welcome yeah thank uh, you (laughs) and thank you for being on the show at the same time hey i appreciate it uh we'll definitely have you come back in the future cool get you involved and and try to get your uh counterparts also involved more in the show since i've been broadcasting right here for a year and we're gonna have jay on probably in a couple weeks uh we'll have you back we'll get little stories i'll have have maybe some growers come on. I had uh, Jeremy on, I don't know, oh, six nice. months ago or Pick so. Pick his brain a little bit? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Picked it all apart. It's still <laughs> laying over there in the corner, I think. <laughs> oh, I see. Oh, <laughs> cool. Uh, you have a great weekend. Cool. And thank you, you very well. much. Thanks for having me. Appreciate it. There you go, Canterpreneurs. Thank you for joining me this week. Make sure to come back next week. We'll be talking to even more guests from the industry, from the government, from the entrepreneur world. Make sure to reach out to us on all the social media, Mass Roots, YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, and any place else, all under the same name, CannabisCommunityProject.com. We'll see you next week. Yeah.